Ja, schönen guten Abend, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich begrüßen im Namen des DFF, Deutsches Filminstitut und Filmmuseum. Und ich ähm, rede jetzt auf Englisch weiter, weil unser Gast ähm, auch ähm, Englisch versteht und kein Deutsch. Um, Nor Norwegian is this year um, guest of honor of the Frankfurt Book Fair. And um, it is our tradition that we, um, um, that we do a company, the um, guest of honor with the film program. And this year we will start a little bit earlier. So we will start now here in September and we'll continue um, in October with a um, series of classical films. Um, when I um, heard that Norwegian will be guest of honor, I was thinking about um, Norwegian cinema and one of the first names that came into my mind was Bent Hammer. And um, so I'm very glad that we will present you the retrospective, um, which will start tonight. And I'm also very, very happy that Bent Hammer um, is here in Frankfurt. Um, a very, very warm welcome to Bent. <laughs> It is also an honor for us because um, Bent will tomorrow fly to um, Canada to um, start with the, um, with the shooting of his new film. So yes, it was perfect timing that he could be here tonight. Um, yes, he will be in Canada, and Canada will be the next year of um, next year's guest of honor. So maybe we'll have you back next year. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> okay. So um, yes, um, as I said, um, Ben Hammer is one of them. Maybe to also here to Germany, the best known. Um, um, Norwegian um, filmmaker. Um, he has, I won't tell too much about um, your life and um, <laughs> your films now because we will have it in the talk later. Um, but um, yes, you have been to a lot of festivals, received a lot of prizes and um, almost all of your films are here in German also in distribution and has also part of them um, co-produced um, co um, with German Germany and um, yes, Pandora film is here tonight also. Thank you for supporting Bent Hammer over all these years. Um, so uh, yes, and um, I want to thank you also the Norwegian Film Institute, especially um, Astrid Blindheim, who has been very well, um, very nice cope. Um, yes, help. Yeah, she helped us with the program. And um, also the Norwegian Film Archive, um, which is part of the National Library. And um, Norla, which is supporting this, um, the guest of honor, um, Norwegian um, 2019. Um, and I want to thank also um, our moderation, Sebastian Balster, who is a journalist um, of the FAZ, um, but also very, he knows a lot about um, Norwegian specialists in Norwegian and Norwegian cinema. And um, yes, he will do the moderation tonight. So um, welcome to you both. Vielen Dank für die freundliche Begrüßung. Schön, dass Sie da sind. Ähm, zwei Dinge möchte ich vorneweg sagen. Wir haben uns gerade darauf geeinigt, ähm, das Gespräch auf Englisch zu führen. Das hat den Nachteil für Sie, Sie hören zweimal Menschen, die das nicht als Muttersprache haben, mit den entsprechenden Peinlichkeiten zwischendrin. Aber wir sparen uns vielleicht den, die Übersetzungsschleife, denn Bens Deutsch ist zwar gut, aber er traut sich nicht. Kann ich das so sagen? <lacht> Und ähm, die zweite Sache vorneweg wäre äh, zu sagen, dass Sie auch eingeladen sind, Ihre Fragen zu stellen. Wir werden an mehreren Punkten im Gespräch ähm, Sie dazu einladen, sich mit Fragen, Kommentaren, wie auch immer zu melden. Und dann können Sie auch gerne auf Deutsch oder Norwegisch äh, losschießen und ich äh, sorge dann für die Übersetzung, falls nötig. Und Ach ja, das Dritte, was ich noch wissen würde vorher gerne, haben Sie alle Kitchen Stories schon mal gesehen? Aber ich habe auch Köpfe schütteln sehen. Also das heißt, wir sind jetzt in der schwierigen Lage, nie zu viel über diesen Film zu verraten, für die, die ihn noch nicht äh, kennen. Ja, wir werden uns Mühe geben. Gleichzeitig können wir nicht vermeiden, dass manche, die den Film schon kennen, vielleicht Fragen stellen, die viel voraussetzen. Wir versuchen unser Bestes, das irgendwie im Balanceakt äh, hinzubekommen. Now, this is a, the, the film is called Kitchen Stories. And uh, Bent, I think Frankfurt is the perfect place to screen a film about kitchens and kitchen research because the Frankfurter Küche is very well known, at least in Frankfurt. But <laughs> how well known is it in Norway? I don't know. I, I didn't know about it when I did the research for this film. 
so, but I mean, we I was looking around when we did research, and uh, at least after the Second uh, uh, World War, uh, the same was going on in in the U.S. I, I know when they had this kind of uh, instruction films that we found in the archives in Sweden as well. So I don't know, maybe there was a period after the uh, World War I also that people had a need to keep things in perfect order and be more efficient. I don't know, maybe that's one of the explanations that it occurred on these uh, uh, different times. Um, but I didn't know about it, no, I didn't. But I, I looked it briefly up uh, and uh, it <laughs> If if I knew it, I would probably dive into it and and uh, yeah, see. Uh, but this is also a little bit. Uh, I mean, between the Norway and Sweden, we always blame the Swedes to be very bureaucratic. So and um, we really understand why it was uh, the Swedes that came up with IKEA and not the Norwegians. So it has to do with that too. So it's a kind of a joke level as well. Uh, yeah. So, but I didn't go out of that. But I, I remember that we uh, I looked up some uh, some films from uh, from the archives in uh, in uh, in America actually at the same time. But now we are talking about the fifties in the beginning of the fifties. And the Frankfurter Küche was uh, in the twenties already. Yeah, I know. So. <laughs> Ahead of its time, there were I think ten thousand Frankfurter Küchen sold at that time. Maybe someone of you has one of them in your home, and you want to show it afterwards to Bent. <laughs> then I think you would be happy to see one. In <laughs> but you learn. I mean, this it's uh, it's uh, lifelong learning, and uh, we talked about this last night also about uh, Frankfurter Kitchen and. Uh, we all learned at school that it was uh, Henry Ford who uh, would say invented uh, the working line. But then I saw a program about uh, Venice for time ago, and they, for many hundred years ago, they was really, as you know, I mean, it was a center of commerce. But they also built a lot of boats, and they had invented the same idea. It, the boats were floating, but they was the, the workers were spe specialized, and they did something on the boat, and then the boats just floated a little bit, and they did another work on it, and that it went on like that until the boat was finished and went out. So they uh, constructed and built a tremendous number of boats in in the same uh, kind of. Uh, environment that we thought that Henry Ford was the f first one to do. So, I mean, now 50s to the 20s and with the boats and cars, I mean, it, it was like several hundred years before. So we are learning all the time. So probably the kitchen scientists was also uh, earlier than uh, in the 20s, I believe. <laughs> but we haven't seen it. Maybe we don't know it yet. Now we dived already into the middle of kitchen stories and what it is about on the surface at least <laughs> uh, kitchen science and you will see this later on um, but I would like to ask Bent Hammer a little bit about his life so that you get to know him a bit better and um, starting with where he was born in Sandefjord mm -hmm. it's a small town in Norway and I would like to know what did Sandefjord to, to you how was growing up there, and what was this kind of life you had when you were growing up in Sandefjord? I didn't know that there was something called uh, film directors or like that. I mean, it's a shipping town and a whale hunting town, <coughs> which is not political correct today, maybe. We we quit in uh, 67 with the whale hunting, started in like, yeah, in the late 1800s, and in 19. Oh four, we went to the Antarctic to continue, and we all know how it went with the blue whale. So, but now it's uh, well, we didn't kill all of them at least. So that's how the. Uh, the but after that, and parallel, the, the my town is built on on shipping. So even if you was not a sailor, uh, you at least had like four or five seasons uh, out at. Uh, uh, on a whaleboat, and you went away for eight 
months. So typically, uh, father he went out and uh, when the children was young and and uh, uh, the ladies had to run the home and the economy and everything. But the moment the man came home, everything had to be switched. So there are a lot of good stories about that. Uh, and the children was screaming because they didn't know the man who's coming with, with the big beer uh, once a year home. Uh, so that's my kind of childhood in a way. Uh, you're not from a whaling family, are you? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, like my grandfather, he had like 30 seasons, I think, and my uncle 12, and my father didn't, but he was like three, four times or something. So that's my early memory. And then I'm a normal guy. I, I played football. That was uh, the big thing. I did a lot of sports, but football, especially football, I, I loved. I did ski jump. Uh, and my mother was a ski jumper. That was a little bit special, a uh, female ski jumper. So another film that uh, they're going to screen here in the retrospective series is uh, called O Horton and it's actually dedicated to to my mother and all all female ski jumpers <laughs> so it's uh, it's true <laughs> um, and then I started of course wherever you come from you want to get away from uh, where you are born it's a uh, uh, however I mean it can be the nicest place but you want to get out so uh, me too and uh, I started to study uh, at the law school. Uh, and I sailed a lot. I've been, uh, yeah, worked as a sailboat skipper and uh, transported boats across the Atlantic and in Caribbean and in the Mediterranean and yeah, all around where I could get a, a job. And then I started to study uh, film theory in Stockholm. There was no study of film in uh, uh, at the University of Oslo, so I had to go to the University of Stockholm or another place. We didn't have a film school either. So I did that and started on my PhD, but by then I really wanted to make films, I must say, so that I quit on that one. I also studied literature one year with literature at the same time. Uh, but only one year with literature. And then I got money from the Swedish Film Institute, actually. I wrote a uh, short film, and uh, yeah, yeah, I made a couple of short films in between also. But, uh, I mean, the, with a good budget, I got from uh, Norwegian uh, Swedish Film Institute. And then I wrote my first feature film uh, uh, script and got support to develop it but at the same time I had delivered uh, what to say it's quite long short film a medium and no film or what we call it uh, and we got support for that one too so I was kind of in a good uh, flow and then we extended that one <laughs> the the short one to be uh, a short feature <laughs> So, and that was Eggs, my first film. And the one I originally wrote, uh, I have never done. <laughs> so, so still, kind of still to be done. And, uh, what? You still want to do it? I don't think so. I don't think so. I I have looked at it a couple of times, but now it's, it's 25, 30 years ago. So, yeah, I don't think so. So, yeah, that's a short, yeah. short version. <laughs> <laughs> You have lived or worked a lot ab abroad as well, and no. traveled to present your films at least. Yeah, yeah, with the, and yeah, I have. What I wanted to ask you was because now you had you told us that you have uh, made this film about female ski jumpers, um, and there's another one about a Norwegian sailor. We will maybe talk a bit more about about other films you made. I want to ask, when you look at your body of work now, also a bit in a retrospective, because it's, it's quite a big body now, and <laughs> is there, to you, something typically Norwegian about it? Maybe the humor and the melancholy, and uh, I, I believe. I mean, we we're coming from the Melancholy vodka belt, above the melancholy vodka belt. <laughs> it's up there. 
Icelandic and Norwegian and Swedes and the Finns. Uh, so I think if I should point out something, I would say that. And uh, but sometimes uh, I see the distributors try to <coughs> label my films as uh, comedies, but I never made a comedy in my life. So, but there are humor in my films, and humor is for me. It's yeah, I shouldn't say it's serious, but it's a it's a wonderful tool. It's a wonderful way of uh, communication to tell a story. Uh, so without uh, being pretentious, I think the poetic humor, if I can use that expression, I, I, I like that expression at least. Uh, so, so if there is something, I would say maybe that. And it's not just for my films, I think for maybe for Nordic films in general, is that that's something that, uh, what to say, can be uh, seen in in a lot of lot of the films, especially films that are traveling quite well abroad. Mm -hmm. So we will be allowed to laugh every now and then, <laughs> <laughs> even though it's not a comedy. Um, another point or something special with Norway and everybody maybe today will think about it. Norway is like the, the land of plenty. Um, one of the richest countries in the world. Oil has made it abundant. What does this this mean for filmmaking? Is money falling from the trees for for filmmakers in Norway? No, I mean to see it in a kind of perspective. Norway was one of the poorest countries in Europe in around 1900, uh, and suddenly in the late 60s we found oil. It's also a good story with the Swedes because uh, the, the Norwegian. I think it was foreign minister and the Swedish foreign minister. They had a discussion and Norway tried to get a piece of Volvo. And against it, we had to give a piece of the oil. And it was a big discussion, really big uh, public discussion, because I think it was called Rosenberg, the uh, Swede, Swedish one or if he was the, the final, I, I don't remember, or industry minister, but he refused. <laughs> and today, <laughs> you, <laughs> you know the answer. If they said yes to that, they, it would have been a fortune for them. The Swedes would be happy. Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, to get uh, this wealth, uh, suddenly it's, uh, yeah, it comes a lot with it, not only, uh, uh, what to say, uh, there are negative and positive sides, but of course, mostly positive uh, effects. It would be stupid to say something different. Mm -hmm. But of course, everything changed. And it also came back to the 50s and this, uh, what to say, this uh, belief in the future after the World War II. And together then with, uh, with the oil money, it was, of course, a very uh, uh, fantastic time for Norway to, to develop as a country. And I mean, Norway also is the, yeah, it's the second uh, country after Ireland, uh, according to the population of immigrants that went to the US. And it's a reason why, and it's because it was so hard times. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's, uh, and that's, it's not that long time ago either. So, but people, and including me, we forget very quick, of course. So. Uh, now it's this is the what to say the level and the young, especially the young people. And I use always the area you haven't. I'm too young too, but uh, uh, I I'm maybe it has to do with your interest for history also. But uh, people think that this is how it has always been in a way. So you have to remind yourself of that, and also to see other people. And then we are coming to immigrants and all that. And, politics and what we should see as a rich country be more open so it depends on who's who's running the country and right now it's a co coalition but one of the four parties uh, don't want immigrants at all so uh, supporting films you said uh, well I must say of course everybody is complaining and it's too little and a rich country could give more to uh, to to art in general and to film, of course. 
but I must also say working abroad and uh, financing abroad uh, and uh, cooperating with uh, with uh, other countries uh, support system I must say we have a good system in Norway and it's uh, it's quite smooth to <coughs> to cooperate with and Germany is also very good I think and your regional funds there are very good and designed for co-productions uh, yeah I shouldn't start talking about what's not good <laughs> but <laughs> not what I think about other countries but so I think we have a good support system of course I for me it could be uh, more money to make films of course but also for art in general i think it's important but that's uh, yeah should we as it is election day today in uh, two dl starter of germany uh, maybe we should tell everybody that this it will be election day next sunday in norway yeah. on a local basis and, and should we keep it to ourselves what is the main issue in most of the big cities, or do you want to tell everybody? Because it's a bit, well, absurd. Yeah, maybe. Look at it from the outside. Yeah. Um, Maut, also city Maut, is this große Streitthema. <laughs> Boom, penge. I don't know what how to call this in English. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. called the toll. The toll when you when you drive through. But that's the yeah, and it they even they established. Uh, uh, a party just focusing on toll it's amazing and it got a lot of uh, members but they now with something happened actually now uh, before the election luckily that uh, they i think they had like seven percent or something and on the gallop but now they are down on two i think was the last so it's 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 getting better <laughs> it's been there are more <laughs> important things in <laughs> but for months it, ha it has been dominating the political debate in Norway. yeah it has people are furious because it's so expensive and yeah uh, but it is expensive because they want to to get rid of the well most of the traffic in the in the in our big cities again pollution and because of the environment so that's uh, that's the other part of, of the understanding of it foreign city and similar problems or yeah, issues of course coming back to f making films yeah. when you finally decided to go to stockholm and the film school were your parents happy uh yeah i think they were happy that i i want to study at least i mean i was it took some years because i was as i said i was sailing and i did a lot of stuff but uh yeah that was okay but i mean there was i didn't know any directors or i didn't think about it i i like to watch films i watched a lot of films when i was younger uh but still for me it was yeah i didn't know anyone who who did it so i had to find my way so it's uh yeah uh, yeah it was exciting for all around me also i i remember it was there was some notice in a, a newspaper local newspaper saying that i was making a short film or something <laughs> but at the same in the same notice it was a bit but isn't he a football player? <laughs> it was something like that. <laughs> so they could really understand that. <laughs> they thought I was a football player, not a filmmaker, <laughs> which was correct also. <laughs> Maybe. <coughs> Maybe this is also a good um, point to look at you. And um, before we get a bit deeper into your movies, your films, and your work as a filmmaker, Maybe you want to come with comments or questions about life in Sunderfjord, <laughs> whale b whaling, football, playing football in Sunderfjord, <laughs> or whatever you would not want to know now. So you don't forget it until uh, the end of, the, of our session. If not, then we can just, yeah. Mich würde interessieren, wie viel Zeit Sie verbringen, die Filme vorzubereiten ähm, und dann tatsächlich zu filmen und wie viel der Schnitt danach dauert. Also wie, wie viel Zeit verbringen Sie damit und wie viel Zeit haben Sie dann, um sich den nächsten Film zu Hause zu überlegen? 
Did you understand? Yeah, I'll translate it as better as well. How much time do you spend on on shooting the the film, on cutting it, and on thinking about the next one, conceiving the next one? How is it, yes your your work load for each of it? If you, it depends, of course, it's hard to answer that question. Uh, but if I see, I made seven feature films, and it's about one film every third year. And I, in general, I can say that it's, let's say it's one year to write it and finance it and one year to shoot it, edit it, and make it uh, finished, and then one year to follow up, to sell it, and to represent. Uh, but this is uh, yeah, not the whole truth, of course, and it can be very different. Uh, and sometimes I have had the next project, uh, not ready, but I know what I want to do next. And other times I really don't know what to do next. So it it's also very different from time to time. Uh, yeah, it's hard to be more precise about that. <laughs> yeah, bitte. Um, I'd like to know what filmmakers influenced you. And the second question would be concerning one of your contemporaries. If you ever watched films of Alex van Warmerdam, and if you did, then what do you think of them? Thanks. Uh, yeah, of course I'm influenced, but I like to think that uh, filmmakers that I like is just a part of uh, what I'm influenced by. I mean, it could be anything I am influenced by uh, uh, to make my films. And in a way, the deepest scene, it's, uh, it's not about films. That's, uh, that's the effect of something. I'm telling a story about yeah, people. So uh, it has nothing to do with film in a way. But of course, it, it concerns other people's films also that I really like. It's something that takes you. Uh, Alex van Wanmerdam, oh yeah. I uh, was living in Oslo and I didn't know him at all. I think this was back in 1988. And I just went to see a film called The Norlingen, which is uh, the Utkant Folke in Norwegian. I don't know if you translate that into German, but it might not fit anyway. Mm. But uh, the Norlingen, I think, was the, the, the yeah. Dutch title. The, the German title was also uh, the Norderlingen. It was, yeah. Yes, it was the same. And I was just... I I laughed, so I was crying, and I, I, I loved it. It's one of my big favorites. Fantastic. And then I... Yeah, I tried to meet him when I was down and did some press in uh, in Amsterdam, but he was busy with theater. He's doing a lot of theater, and yeah, he's very uh, busy with things. And then I got from the distributor I had there, I think it was, I got his next film, or was it one before called Abel, Abel, which I liked also very much. And uh, yeah, and I have been following him and uh, watched him, so absolutely. But it was really by accident that I bumped into him with the first on the Norling, and that's absolutely still my my favorite uh, films, film of oh, his selection of films. Yeah. You just mentioned seven feature films by now. The first one in 1995, Eggs. It was the the start, so to say. It short films before, but um, X was 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 a big success, and and I would like to know what does it mean for a young filmmaker <laughs> to start the career with a success? All the critics loved it. Of course, it's a flying start, and we really didn't. We, well, we hoped, and we, we didn't really know about Cannes and all this. Uh, I mean. But uh, f 
first we found out that we need a good distributor. And there was my distributor in Norway, he knew about this uh, this uh, Swiss distributor, Krista Saredi. She was famous. She had uh, Jim Jarmusch and Aki Kaurus Meiki and uh, uh, the German, the, yeah, all of these very good, uh, let's say, independent uh, filmmakers. So we thought that maybe we should uh, screen it for her. And they said, yeah, but it's it's very special, this. So maybe you should also go fly to Cannes because it's the deadline now and screen it for the 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 Cannesen jury. And then we said, but we are not, we have no sound. It's uh, it's only three days of sound. Yeah, but just do it. Then you can make a, a schlosk mix, what you call that, just a contemporary mix that we did in a very short time. And we had no, uh, and it was reels. I mean, it was magnetic reels. And uh, it's like 25 kilos with sound and 25 kilos with, uh, with the picture. So 50 kilos. So I traveled to Paris and we screened it uh, with, the, with the subtitles on, on, the, on the paper. I don't know if they read it uh, at all. And it was... Uh, uh, Oh, what's his name? Uh, the former uh, Kansen. Well, now there have been uh, a lot of them. Uh, Delo, who was there. And uh, we delivered it, and we were sitting on a bar next to the screening there. And he came without uh, any, what to say, expression of his face. So we thought, this, <laughs> this won't function at all. I mean, watch the film in Norwegian and Swedish, no subtitles and a very bad sound could go. And then we flew to, so, so we did that at least, so we had the kind of at least courage. And then we screened it for Krista Saredi uh, with Hanneke she had also and yeah, all this good. And uh, well, then my, my uh, let's say companion, he was sitting just behind her on the screening and, uh, and and translated into her ear, and I was sitting behind there again, and it's it was just awkward and strange. And then I went up to get all the reels, and but the, uh, the projectionist he was very, and he didn't understand anything of it, but he's very good. So we got a little hope. And uh, Krista, she that's why she maybe she couldn't. She, she ended uh, as uh, as a uh, sales agent because I, I think she she nearly died of it. She was really like a coach on the, on a big football team. She was really working hard to to sell the films, so she she burned out I think in in, in the end. But she was on kind of on on the top of her career by then, and she was smoking with both hands, and she didn't say a word either. So. <laughs> We didn't know. And then we went to a, a, a restaurant and we thought that she would say that, yeah, it's interesting, something like that. But then she started to shout at us, maybe not for one hour, but at least for 45 minutes. And meanwhile, she was smoking and we couldn't get the one word in. And she said how hard it was and how if I thought it was that easy and with Carlos Meg he had so and so many uh, people watching his films, the admissions here and there and John. I was like, can't she just say that uh, she don't want to take it? I mean, but then finally, it was a pause and I said, but I love the film, I am gonna fight for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> And then we went home to, it was in Sweden, I did the, the editing, and uh, we just continued. And then there came a phone from Paris, they, want us, they wanted us to, to can. So we got both those things, both of them was very important. So of course it was a really a flying start. I, I couldn't, I mean, I didn't dream, I, I didn't know what I went to, to mm. tell you the truth. So yes, and that was of course important for your uh, career that people, yeah, then people look at your stuff at least with with an interest, even if they don't like it, at least they take you seriously in a way. So, 
because the dark side of it could be that you will always be measured against this big success that you started your career with. It was not a big success like that, uh, not the box office, uh, but it was uh, a strange, small, little film that people got a chance to see, and for me it was fantastic at least. But as a filmmaker, and I think that's all persons in life, we think that, well, next film will be better, and next day can be better than this day. So. Uh, we always hope for. We haven't made the best film yet. It, it's in the future. Now, X is about two elder brothers living far away from other people and from the rest of society. Then came Enda um, Tilly Sulen. It's about a Norwegian sailor far away from home, so to say. And then Kitchen Stories that you will see after we watch uh, right now, you will see it's also about elder men, those of you who don't know it yet, lonely in a way. And uh, Factotum, another one, is about a loner. So is it fair to say that for you as a filmmaker, lonely people are more interesting to explore than social ones? Not necessarily. But uh, yeah, I said melancholy, I used that expression and humor but uh, yeah uh, well I'm not finished yet we'll see <laughs> but maybe maybe I, I, it's my taste also what I like the, the Vamir Damir is also maybe that's why I liked it uh, I said the Nor Norling with the He's playing the main part himself, if I remember right, and he's the postman man. And this is also in, is it in the beginning of the 60s when they moved a whole quarter of people out to a brand new place and they built up houses. Uh, but there are like, they're missing something out there, like the church, then all of them had to go by buses back to the civilization in a way. But he's the postman and just before he get into the to the to the new uh, community, he opens all the post. He he's, uh, uh, he has his coffee pot and making coffee on the fire, and then on the dump he open uh, open the envelope. So he knows everything about everyone in in the in the, that's his idea. Uh, uh, so. Yeah, he is quite lonely, even if he knows about all these people, you can say. So maybe that's why I like it. Also. But it's very it's very funny also with the ice cream sellers coming when exactly... It's hard work to get all the way out there with the ice cream in a kind of uh, this... Uh, what to call it? This... Uh, uh, yeah, when he can... He had to walk with it. And, that's the day when they all have been bussed into town to go to church. So he's ringing in his bell, but there are no people home. <laughs> so it's like that. His humor is also, I feel. But the loneliness, yes. I like to tell maybe stories. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, and old people, like you said, also. I started, I got that question a lot, I remember, when I was I was younger and always was old men. And I'd be the, don't you want to make films with uh, other than old men? And I said, yes, probably, but I, that's what I came up with now. But I must also say that I like to work with older actors because yeah, most directors don't want the actors to act. I mean, they want them to be in a way. And when you are old, you are older before you are actor. That's how I like to see it, at least. And then you have your own tempo. And please just do it in your own tempo. Then you automatically will get uh, some authenticity, uh, I think. And often humor also. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe I was lazy. It was easy to, easier to direct old people than young people. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you also said it's always a male main character, um, apart from 1,001 grams. Um, yeah, in the Spanish film, it's... Uh, oh, yes. Uh, th there are girls, if you, if you, if you look... You have to look carefully. closely. 
<laughs> so maybe it can be you can help a little bit with our lives. Um, what have you learned uh, exploring these characters to grow old in a decent way as a man? <laughs> it's also in my yeah. own interest that I ask you. Yeah. What what yeah, uh, kind I, of tips can you give me? I remember I I used to people ask why what do you want with the film and uh, what is filmmaking uh, what what it means to you and maybe I mean you can say I mean this is to try to understand it but maybe it was even a kind of preparation to allow yourself in the end to get away with being a special person I mean to organizing your life exactly how we want it with no interference from other people so I learned maybe the audience to see that people are uh, they're organizing their lives in totally different ways and it could be quite charming to see it also even if it's not fitting into the the what to say the normal uh, that people think is the normal so maybe it's it maybe it is a preparation to be old and to be accepted um, with all my how I gonna organize my life <laughs> I don't know making films as a preparation for life that's a nice uh, way to sum it up your filmmaker which means in your case that you are directing the films you're producing them and you have been writing the scripts so you're doing everything Absolutely not. And uh, the, the, the film is really a teamwork, and uh, it can't be said enough. There are so many people behind it who are working, yeah, twenty-four-seven for months, and yeah, sitting a couple of them right there. And uh, but yeah, in a way, unfortunately, it's the uh, director. The, and the actors you you see and who take all the all the honor but also sometimes all the <laughs> all the bad critics if 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 that comes but uh it's a lot of people behind it and you can't make a film alone and in this way we are making films at least so uh, that's for sure maybe this is again a good point to look at you and now we've come a bit further in uh, Ben's life and his films. And before we have a final little chapter about kitchen stories and maybe what is to be expected for the future, you could come in with your questions or your ideas. Yes, please. Kitchen stories as playing in the 50s has it, has it uh, something to do with your own childhood maybe uh, you experienced uh, it in your old childhood the 50s maybe you were born in the 50s I remember to read it uh, no it's I mean it's before my my time uh, but bit, yes. I I uh, I Sometimes or very often you really don't, you, it's hard to point out where the idea is coming from and when, if it is one moment when you decide to make a film. I mean, uh, it's not that uh, focused often. But on this one, I bought uh, several of the same book. I found at uh, a second-hand bookshop called the home and us or something like that directly translated schick or bruk i don't know in german what would you say yeah schick or bruk Göril. how would you translate it <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how you do things at home right? yeah and this books uh, you had it here in uh, there are some people who are a little bit older here maybe you remember this book was always in uh, in every home it was a book and it was about how to live your life to become a yeah, happy family and it was a little bit of 
anything. Uh, 2,000 pages. And I bought several of these books. We also had one in my family, but I gave them away as present because it's really a document over the 50s, uh, how people, maybe not how it was, but how they wanted it to be. And it's, it's a fantastic reading, actually. It's really a, a document. And on one of the pages, there was this very strange diagram over a kitchen uh, when you had the, the kitchen stations like the uh, the fridge, uh, the garbage, uh, and so on. It, all the stations was uh, uh, written around the uh, uh, circle, and then there was lines between the stations. And as a thicker line, as more often the housewife, because it was not men in the kitchen at that time, uh, as more often she had been frequented uh, the two stations. And by, and this was done by observation, and by then seeing if there was a thick line from one station to another, and those two stations was far away, it will be much more efficient to put them together. And it was in one of the ads, because at that time they also mixed the, uh, what to say the the science with the with the private companies who were selling uh, these tools for kitchens and fridges and uh, stoves and like that. So it's it, it was a mixture that would be difficult today, I think. Uh, but then there was even an ad saying that now if you organize your kitchen this way, you, the the housewife don't have to go the distance. Stockholm to Congo. It's enough that she goes from Stockholm to Rome. I mean, like that, so people, ordinary people could understand what it was to earn if you just organized your kitchen in this uh, efficient way. I read that and I even took some uh, prints of it and I used it for invitations and I, I never thought about it could be a, what to say, an ID for a for a full feature film, until one strange day, I just thought that. I just thought it, and I got it all in my head. Wow, this is actually the idea. I will make a film based on this idea. And then it went, it's kind of strange idea, but it went so quick and people, it was so easy to, uh, to pitch for people. So I, I think that's the easiest film I've been financing in my uh, career. So everybody was uh, happy about it. So there was something there with, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so that was how I came about this and how I, yeah, it all started. And this was made by the Swedish Home Research Institute, this uh, research. So that's why I also had to cooperate with Sweden and get into the archives in Sweden, uh, and so on. So it was a, a very uh, exciting travel back in time, but even if it was not from my childhood, it's a little bit before. It's, of course, it reminded me of my yeah, grandmother and that period of time and her kitchen. It, it did, actually. We will all get to know the Swedish Home Research Institute. <laughs> soon <laughs> for those of you who don't know it yet you'll see it on the on the screen yeah yeah and it's it's quite close to well what i did this was all the research was done in the laboratory so uh, i and it was done by uh, scientists and they did it with the uh, females of course as i said the, the if you put a man in the kitchen at that time, he didn't know what to do. I mean, he he, he would still think he was in a, in a garage. So this was and uh, yeah. Another thing is interesting is that by upgrading the the females the, the kitchen, that was also a kind of nasty way. Or then you really uh, conserved her there <laughs> for a long time as well. Then you know where you had her, and you kind of upgraded her position also. But yeah, it's a lot of stories going on. I mean, when people get married and the mother of the husband had to come in and see how 
the kitchen was and I mean it's horrible stories I I'm happy that we are a little bit longer today <laughs> today it's also it to go a little bit further on I mean uh, with uh, with the man's coming into the kitchen then again it's upgraded and with all the tools and because men start have been starting to make foods so that's another kind of level in the kitchen history starting with the Frankfurt kitchen maybe but probably before <laughs> um, now the first I'm, when I was preparing for our meeting tonight I had a I I, scr I I scrolled, so to say, through your films, and it struck me that I was always remembering the first scenes, the best of your movies, to be true. Oh. <laughs> and you will see this. I think there's, they, you, but f could be famous at least too for the big for long opening, opening shots. <laughs> the opening director. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this can't be new to you. Um, it's a long shot. Um, almost epic having all these Volvos <laughs> coming in yeah. and you will see this in a couple of minutes so how much energy do you really invest in, in this and, and how easy does it come to you to find your opening scene that's also a hard question but of course to to, to introduce something it's important because it uh, it depends how you bring people in I mean if you can bring people into, if, if it's film or a book or whatever, then you can get away with uh, anything in a way. You just have to bring them in in a, in a good way. Then you can get down to details mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. So I think opening and even yeah, endings is also nice to summarize mm -hmm. something. Uh, but I don't think about it that I mean it's the story and I but it's somewhere probably it's of course mm -hmm. now I would like to know just to end the, the our discussion today I would like to know what he's working on right now so maybe you can tell us a bit about your work in progress yeah I'm yeah this book fair is starting very soon and I'm uh, I, I can say that I never plan to adapt. I, I'm not reading books to find uh, stories to adapt. But uh, yeah, this one came to me. So I'm, I have adapted. Uh, well, there's a book by Lars Sobe Christensen. He's a very famous Norwegian writer or Nordic writer with a lot of books. And uh, he wrote a book back in uh, 2012. Uh, and it consists of three stories, and I have adapted the m the middle story, which also called uh, the middleman, and it all takes part in a small town in the U.S. It's a kind of Trump territory where people have no belief in the future, no future prospects, uh, and it's a lot of uh, death and. Uh, it's the doctor, the pastor, and the sheriff, the commission they are called, are running the town as good as they can. A lot of shops are closed down, the industry are closed down. And they need someone to convey the bad news in a way. When someone dies, uh, the pastor can do it, but it's too many of them. So they have to employ a middleman and his uh, mission is to go and tell the relatives when someone has died. Uh, so it's the kind of beacon of bad news in this town. And it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of humor, actually. It's uh, black humor. It's quite, um, to say, uh, yeah, it's very up to date, the, the uh, the situation for many people unemployed I mean not only in in the US and if you st if I look into the numbers in the US it's uh, we don't know about that I mean uh, that's one way of understanding why people are voting as they are doing also 
but also in Europe, see in Spain, I mean, and young people up to, is it 45% of unemployed young people and so on. So, um, but it's uh, a lot of humor and it's it's a love story in there um, as well. And it is a little hope in the end. So there is an end scene, which is also with the hope it is, uh, yeah. Not to say too much, but that's what I'm doing. Uh, or we're going to shoot it now in Canada, in uh, Ontario. In uh, in uh, it's called Sault Ste. Marie. It's all the way up, if you know the Lake Michigan or Lake Huron, and there is a delta in between that lake, those lakes, and uh, Lake Superior. And it's a town there called Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan which is the American side, or Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, which is the Canadian side. And it's a bridge that divide the town in two, actually, and the countries. I mean, it's Canada on one side and uh, the US on the other side. So we're gonna, we have found the fantastic locations there. So we're going to shoot 20 days up there, approximately, and uh, like 12 days in uh, uh, in uh, Cologne and around Cologne, NRW, uh, in yeah, some scenes in Duisburg and in Solingen and yeah, a little bit around. So, yeah, and we will be able to see this one in German cinemas. Absolutely, absolutely. Pandora will uh, release it as as always. <laughs> next year or the yeah, next year? Okay. Next, next, uh, probably next fall in Germany. I would say, yeah. Das können Sie in Ihrem Hinterkopf behalten und Sie können unbedingt sich die Tage anmerken, an denen die anderen Filme von Bentama in dieser Retrospektive gezeigt werden, hier im Filmmuseum. Und jetzt, wenn Sie ganz dringend noch was loswerden wollen, wäre es jetzt. Ansonsten ist unsere Stunde zu Ende und der Film soll ja dann auch anfangen, damit Sie irgendwann nach Hause kommen, an diesem schönen Sonntagabend. Ähm, haben wir noch Wer noch mal irgendwie ganz dringend raus muss, ja, sollte es jetzt gerne tun. Gerne noch ein, zwei Fragen, also wenn noch Bedarf besteht. Genau. Wenn nicht. Ja, doch, eine gibt es noch. Um, a question concerning the actors. Well, all the old guys we see in the Kitchen Stories and the film that you did prior to the Kitchen Story, the eggs, or the egg? Eggs. Eggs, ja. Uh, Were those professional actors or some of them not? <laughs> That's very nice. When I, I got that question many times and uh, that's one of the best uh, thing I can tell the actors when, an, when I get questions like that. They, uh, because I think that's a kind of quality mark uh, when you ask like that. They are all at the national. Both of them was at the, the old one in X was at the national theater for a lifetime, so they are. But they, yeah, they managed to, to not to act, <laughs> like we said. So, I like that uh, question because I I don't think you say it because they are bad. I hope it's because they are believable. <laughs> That's at least how I tell the actors when I get the question like that. Well, both of them are dead now, unfortunately. But that's it. Yeah, thank you. Then, vielen Dank, Bent Hammer, and vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Tusen Tag, at du kom til Frankfurt. Thank you for being here, and thank you for coming uh, Sunday evening. And I hope you enjoyed the film. Thank you.